from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We have a very big program today. We have Rick Reeder from BlackRock. We also have the Secretary of Energy, Dan Bruett. But first, we want to check on those markets because the Fed sort of made a ripple, them, I think it's fair to say. And we have Taylor Riggs here to tell us all about it. Hey, David, yeah, I just want to first start with the S&P 500 now on track for the best week going back since 2008. At one point when gains were a lot higher, we were on track for the best week going back since 1974. So a lot of hope in that optimism continuing to filter through within the equity markets. I wanted to take a look at some of the junk bonds as well, because as you know, uh, Powell did say that he would be effectively supporting fallen angels. So if you were triple B before March 22nd and then subsequently downgraded to double B, you still um, do qualify perhaps for that purchasing program. You are seeing some moves as well in crude as we were hearing that there was about a 10 million barrel per day cut. Earlier we thought that would be 20 million barrels a day. So still trying to get some of those final details from OPEC in that meeting that started just uh, two hours ago or so as those details continue. Uh, to come through. I do want to take a look again at the S&P 500 here on a four day week because uh, we know it is a shortened holiday week and so uh, the bond markets will be closing in just a few hours, but it does mean uh, that the market's still having some of the best week as I mentioned uh, going back at one point since 1974, David. Okay, thank you so much to Taylor Riggs. As we said, it has been largely a day about the Federal Reserve. And we have joining us now Rick Reeder. He is CIO, Chief Investment Officer for Global Fixed Income for BlackRock and also head of their global allocation team, asset allocation team. So Rick, welcome. When I heard this this morning, I must say, I think my jaw literally dropped. What was your reaction? <laughs> I, uh, I may have done that in unison with you, David. I, I think the uh, this is an incredible, I mean, you know, it's a whole series of things followed by Chair Powell's uh, uh, presentation afterwards, uh, interview afterwards, he, um, I mean, not only are they getting into, um, it's obviously the size of already what they've announced has been incredible <clears throat> and they, and going further deeper in terms of what they're doing, but they're getting at just wide swaths of different, uh, marketplaces. In fact, there's always been this question about the could the Fed extend credit and they don't like to be in credit. And they are going there. I mean, they're going there and they're going there into, I mean, even the CLO market. You think about, I mean, that's almost unfathomable that, the, that they're going to the CLO market. But I think you have to give them a tremendous amount of credit because when people criticize them, they're going into areas they haven't or taken on credit. But they're doing it. It's so well thought out in the way they're doing it. And, they, and so that they're not preferencing one company versus another so that it is it is balanced in the way they're doing it. And listen, there's going to be some things you tweak over time, but it was really well thought out. You, know, you have to give them a tremendous amount of credit for what they're doing. And none of that, when, when Jay Powell said, listen, we're going, to, we're going to be deliberate and we're not going to take these off until we see the economy strongly on its footing. Having regained its footing is a very big deal. Yeah, it's something we actually talked to Jack Liu about yesterday, tre former Treasury Secretary. And he said people have to be willing to extend this sort of support longer than you might think, because even after we've passed the crisis or turning the point on the crisis, the economic disaster is going to continue. As you look at it, can you put any sort of priorities into the various things? Because they're doing small business lending. They're doing mainstream lending. They're doing the support for states and local governments across the board. What counts the most? So I'd say the first thing that counts that I think is uh, maybe maybe that's a subtle uh, event. But when when he was asked about inflation, and they'll talk about the program, when he was asked about inflation, and he says, we're just not worried about that today. And he laid out a very, very thoughtful, pragmatic description of how inflation is not going to be a problem. Anyway, that's a really big deal because it means you can be longer. It means you can take, you can take your time and let these programs work until the economy gets its footing. First thing is you have to bring interest rates down. That was really a big deal. I and mean, that was arguably the first thing they did. And then, but particularly provided liquidity to the markets when they're buying assets, not going to negative rates, but buying assets. And then the other thing that I think is incredibly important around having done that is the willingness now to go into other spaces and say, and it's AAA assets that, were, that are the foundation mortgages. And what they did today, AAA commercial mortgages, um, AAA CLOs, if you can't, if the world can't finance AAA assets, then the building blocks for everything else in the financing markets and to equities doesn't work. And I think all of that is, was incredibly powerful. 
Does this relieve any of the pressure on Congress to act? Because, for example, one of the disputes right now up on Congress, they're supposed to be debating it today, is whether we need to get some assistance to the states right away, because the states are really badly hurting. As they're going into the, the muni market, does that relieve some of the pressure because the states can borrow more money more easily? It does. I mean, it, you know, part of what's in the Senate, it takes a lot of time. You got to read through all of it and all the nuance around each of these each of these proposals or implementations. But what they're doing, it's interesting. They're going at it. The way they've addressed it is not at these smaller municipalities, but they're, they're what they're doing is they're providing liquidity to and funding for the bigger um, populations, i.e., at the state level, and then you'll get this trickle down effect that will get into the small, into the smaller municipalities. And it was very well thought through in terms of how they do that, how they did that. And yes, it does take some of the pressure off of Congress, but it is, you know, the way they've set up these policies with Treasury providing what is functionally the equity, and then uh, and then the Fed providing the liquidity or the leverage to it has been pretty powerful. And obviously, Congress has to authorize Treasury having done that, and, and I think that's worked effective heretofore. Well, as I understand it, Rick, Treasury essentially takes first loss, which is something like 10% of the loss. Is that going to be enough to cushion the Fed from losing money? Because it's not supposed to lose money. Yeah, no, it's, uh, that is definite, definitely right. I mean, I, you know, it's not, something about, I mean, the Federal Reserve around, it's not, it's not a, a profit and loss entity like a financial institution. So it's always been a bit nebulous to that end. But treasuries, your, your point is well taken around treasury providing that first loss of the equity to it. Listen, the, the treasury can go di can go bigger in terms of what they do in providing more backstop and more first loss. And listen, I think there's something that we've learned over the years on these programs. They end up coming in, and to a point in time, that's a point of time of distress. They tend to work out very well for the treasury and they, and, and Fed. And they tend to work out in a way that actually sends money back to taxpayers, which is a really big deal. And I think that will be the case again in this, in this situation. As the economy is going to bounce back, we can debate how, how much it bounces back. But you're going to have an economy that's going to bounce back, and these programs will end up being, uh, you know, being, I think, A, effective, and B, um, I, don't, I think the taxpayer will get, a, will get a nice dividend back from it. And that's part of what Chair Powell said today, actually. I think he surprised some people by suggesting it's going to rebound and maybe rebound more quickly than we might have thought as a practical matter. But at the, at the same time, you, you say this has to go on for an extended period of time. To what extent is basically, as they say, the referee playing in the game here? As you look at the markets you look at, whether it's fixed income or, it, or it's on the equity side, uh, how much of the market's reacting today to just what the Fed is doing rather than any underlying fundamentals? Oh, you're definitely right. I mean, uh, the... Uh you know, the markets, you know, you can debate of the markets overshooting. I mean, you think about the, the, the day, they, like you said, you know, they, what the Fed did is a ripple through the market. I mean, parts of the high-yield market and credit markets, it's a, it's a virtual tidal wave of the impact that it's having. You know, markets tend to overshoot. Um, but, you know, I, I think when, you, when this is a very, very unique circumstance, it's different than OA, different than maybe any other crisis, and that we do think the economy is going to rebound. And we do think, I mean, listen, we think you could have a second quarter that is something like an annualized run rate of, of 30% decline in the economy. But we think third quarter, 12% up, fourth quarter, you get 8% up. And then next year, you know, we're going to have the stimulus will still be working through the system. You'll have a pretty good GDP number. We think over 5% the year after. So, listen, I think the markets are right. We, you know, the markets shouldn't go back to where they were. But, uh, but getting, you're getting closer to factoring in the, uh, you know, what's happened and this immense amount of stimulus that I think, is, uh, that I think the markets are rightfully uh, adjusting to. So, so, so Rick, uh, how is the way you put money to work today different than it was yesterday, given what the Fed's done? As an investor, what does an investor do today that they wouldn't have done yesterday or vice versa? Uh, it's, a big, it's, a, it's a big deal. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we are... You know, we, if you go back a day, 24 hours ago, you were the way you thought about, you know, if you were a AAA asset because the Fed was getting at that, if you were a high quote, that, that you were in good shape, if you were investment grade uh, bondholder, credit holder, you were in pretty good shape because the Fed was there, certainly in mortgages. But you've now extended this and, and that, you know, the high yield market, it's definitely supportive of companies, not just the high yield market, but a lot of the triple B companies that are going to go into high yield that those actually become a lot safer. The CLO market or the loan market generally, you know, with the Fed providing what is functionally, you know, not to get too technical, 
around what's happened. Uh, but the Fed going into that CLO market, the AAA part of the CLO market, lifts a lot of what was blockage in the system around loans. So that gives you a lot more comfort. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, I think the equity market reacts to what is stable financial conditions and a bridge from here to there. And so to take on some, some more equity risk, I think, is, uh, you know, makes some sense. And, you know, we're doing, I think, like a lot of people, we've been running high levels of cash in our portfolios yeah, because the uncertainty was so great, <clears throat> given how much stimulus is coming in from the fiscal as well as the monetary side, you can take a little bit of that cash. You still should run high levels of cash, mm. but you can spend some of that money even in the markets that you were less less willing to do it a day ago. Yeah. yeah, which I think was the goal after all. Rick, really appreciate you being with us today. That's Rick Reeder of BlackRock. And coming up here, we're going to talk with the Energy Secretary of the United States. He is Dan Bruett as we wait for that possible oil deal between Saudi Arabia and Russia. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Oil markets have been rocked, first by the collapse in demand because of the pandemic, and then Saudi Arabia decided to have a price war with Russia. We now welcome the person who is responsible for U.S. energy policy. He is the Secretary of the Department of Energy, and he is Dan Briette. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, so much for joining us. First of all, as we talk, we're not sure what's going on. Do you have any information about whether, in fact, a deal has come forth? There's reporting they are close to one. Well, thanks, David. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I, I am not aware of an actual deal. All I know is what I see in the open source, but I do remain optimistic that they will, in fact, reach a deal sometime today. So there's a lot of speculation about what that deal may look like. Uh, and at one point, they were talking about 20 million barrels a day, reduction in production. At one, at one point, somebody said they needed 27 million, but now reports are it might be as low as 10 million barrels a day. Will that be enough as you look at the global energy market? I think any number above zero is going to be a good number for the market and for the uh, for the world economies. The oil, the oil today currently has no place to go. Uh, as you know, David, when you're producing oil, you usually have uh, but two options. You can either use it or you can store it. And in the case that we face today with the reduced demand uh, as a, as a, as a you know, product or result of the pandemic, you can't use it. There's simply no demand for the gasoline. There's no demand for the crude. So you're left with storage options, and that's running out very, very fast. So whether they reach a deal today or not, uh, I think the fact of the matter is, is that we're going to see some reductions uh, coming from companies who produce oil all around the world. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, President Trump has been very direct in saying that uh, if the oil price is too low, it can damage the U.S. energy industry. What kind of damage are we seeing right now? What kind of price do we need to protect the U.S. energy industry? Well, we're seeing we're seeing reductions all across the world, but we're also seeing them uh, very specifically here within the geographic uh, boundaries of the United States. So, you know, the latest numbers that I have before me show the rig count down about 108 rigs over the course of the last two years. It may be, I mean, two weeks, I'm sorry. It may be a little higher than that today. This is data that's probably two or three days old. But we're seeing that. We have saw the, uh, the major announcements by uh, corporations all throughout the country, uh, roughly 30 percent or so down in uh, capital expenditures. That's about $24 billion dollars pretty significant reduction over last year. And what that means is that you're going to see, you know, decreased production until the remainder of 2020. Our own EIA puts that number at somewhere around 1.6, 1.7 million barrels per day. And that could easily turn into 2 million barrels per day by the end of the year. So we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing the production numbers decline here, at least in the short term in the United States. And unfortunately, that's going to mean, you know, some layoffs and potentially some uh, reduction in employment as well. Uh, we are waiting for an agreement uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia, really, as a practical matter. But what tools do we have in our toolkit in the United States? And one of the things that has been suggested, maybe requested by places like Russia, is that the United States curtail its production as well. Is that something that could be on the table? Well, we're, we've already done that. Uh, you know, th there is no mechanism in the United States that I'm aware of anyway uh, where the government mandates a, a, either a production number, an increase or a decrease, or certainly not uh, some price point that is mandated by the government either. 
the, the beautiful thing about the American marketplace is that it adjusts almost immediately to a demand curve. If there's no demand, you'll have no production. And we've seen that over the course of the last few weeks uh, with this pandemic. So, you know, there, there aren't many tools available, you know, from a, a federal government standpoint to have outcomes with regard to production. Now, that being said, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, you have two options. One of those options is storage, and the president has directed me to make available space in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, to the industry, and that's what we're doing. We have approximately 77 million barrels of space there down in Louisiana and Texas, and we're making that available to the industry for storage purposes. So, so are, you, are you continuing to buy for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Could you buy more and buy faster? You know, we're authorized uh, by federal law to uh, store up to 1 billion barrels in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So I'm going to be working with Congress to see if there's interest in expanding the current capabilities of the reserve itself. I hope that they find interest in doing that. I think it's important for us to do that, as the president has pointed out. Uh, you know, the government has a, you know, horrible history, if you will, of buying high and selling low. And, uh, you know, as a former businessman, as a former CEO, uh, the president knows full well that that is backwards. And we're making every effort that we can we can make to take advantage of, you know, the situation that we have today. We're trying to make lemons out of uh, or lemonade out of lemons, I should say, uh, given the situation that we have. But, you know, we're going to move as aggressively as we can to make this storage available. Uh, the G20 energy ministers are going to be having a, a call, at least together, as I understand it, on Friday. You'll be participating, I believe. What do you expect or hope to come out of that? Well, you know, what we're going to be talking about in the G20 is, uh, one, the, you know, the economies of our respective countries. What are we doing uh, to stabilize not only the oil markets within uh, our respective economies, but what are we going to do to rebuild our economies you know, once we get on the other side of this pandemic. There's a lot of interest in doing that. So you'll hear a lot of conversations about what's happened in our energy space. And importantly, because energy underpins so much of the world economy and so much of the individual economies of the members of the G20, what are we doing in our respective boundaries to ensure that this industry survives this pandem pandemic and comes out of the other side as strong as it was when we, when we were in the pre-pandemic phase? In addition to the G20, however, we're also going to be talking uh, to ministers I'm going to meet later today, as a matter of fact, with my colleagues both in Mexico and Canada, uh, to have a trilateral, trilateral uh, conversation about what we're going to do here in North America and uh, what is it that we can do uh, as part of the USMCA, as part of other agreements that are already on the books, to ensure that our uh, energy industry remains as strong and interconnected as it is today. Uh, as we've said, Russia is part of the issue here as they've increased production in this price war with Saudi Arabia. One of the issues on the table are the sanctions we have against Russia, as I understand it, particularly involving that Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Is that on the table? Would we consider making some concessions there in order to get the Russians to curtail their production? Well, sanctions fall under the uh, purview of the Treasury Department and the State Department, so I don't want to speak for my colleagues, uh, you know, Secretary Mnuchin or Secretary Pompeo. But I can tell you they've not been a part of the conversations that I've had with uh, my colleagues in Russia, Mr. Novak, as well as um, Prince Abdulaziz, the energy minister in Saudi Arabia. Those types of conversations have not come up in the dialogue that we've been having nearly every day for the last two weeks. And finally, Mr. Secretary, um, uh, one of the things that President Trump has indicated a willingness to use is tariffs in various situations. Is that a possibility? Is that on the table? If we can't get mm -hmm. out of the OPEC plus agreement what we need, might the U.S. impose tariffs on oil? Well, I think the president has been very clear that he will, he will use whatever tool is available to him to address the situation at hand. You know, and as, as we have uh, discussed in the past, as others have opined in the past, to the extent that any player uh, wants to take predatory advantage of the U.S. market, uh, the president will use the tools available to him as president of the United States, and he will act uh, appropriately and in accordance with the actions that we see in the marketplace. So he's taking nothing off the table. But, uh, you know, at the same time, he's, no, he's made no commitment to impose tariffs on anyone either. That sounds like it's possible but not imminent. Uh, that would be one way to characterize it, Dave.
<laughs> Fair enough. Okay, Mr. Secretary, <laughs> no, I really appreciate uh, you spending time with us today. Go ahead. Okay, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. That's Dan Brouette. He is the U.S. Secretary of Energy. This is Bloomberg Television and Radio, and I'm David Weston. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour, and it is Costco. People have been flooding into Costco and buying things off the shelves, but maybe not quite as much as Wall Street had hoped for. And we turn now to Abigail Doolittle for a report. Well, David, this is certainly an interesting one because the shares of Costco today, despite the big rally that we do have for U.S. stocks, are underperforming down right now about 1.5%. At the lows, down 2.6%. And this does happen or is happening after Costco put up a very good comp sale for the month of March, up 12%. But as you alluded to, not quite what Wall Street was looking for. The street was looking for up 24.1% because, of course, Costco, this big box retailer, all the hoarding around the virus, uh, they thought – Analysts thought that the number would be uh, bigger, but the virus actually curbed uh, that possibility for Costco because they had to limit the number of people that went into the stores, reduce store hours, temporarily close some of the departments. So again, the number overall a little bit disappointing. Food sales off, uh, you know, really off the charts, up 35 percent. The average sale was also up in a big way too, up 5.7 percent. As consumers are really stockpiling around uh, the virus and wondering how long uh, the shutdown that is in place in some areas uh, will last. As for geographic uh, segments, it wasn't uh, just the U.S. that did well. There was strength in the U.S., Canada, some of the other international areas, and then online. And, you know, David, Costco might be underperforming today, but on the year it's a different story because on the year uh, investors really have been moving to Costco uh, for this hoarding potential, and uh, the shares are up just slightly, uh, even with the S&P 500 down. So, uh, again, Costco down on the day, up on the year, outperforming on the year. Just a little bit of a blip here, David. Thanks so much, Abigail Doolittle. Yeah, we're all flocking to Costco, if we can put up with the lines, I must say. Coming up next, we're going to be talking with Representative Gregory Meeks from Queens about the situation in his home district. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Senate Democrats have blocked Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's attempt to quickly pass a $250 billion boost in aid to small businesses. Democrats want twice as much help for the slumping economy, including more federal aid for hospitals as well as for state and local governments. Leaders of both parties will now try to find a compromise. There's an encouraging outlook from the nation's top infectious disease expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci tells NBC that U.S. deaths from the coronavirus may be as low as 60,000. That's far fewer than earlier projections. Dr. Fauci says safety measures such as social distancing are helping. Italy is reporting a higher number of new coronavirus cases and deaths today. Civil Protection Authorities reported about 4,200 new cases of the disease compared with 3,600 a day earlier. More than 18,000 people in Italy have now died from the virus. Bloomberg has learned that Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte is preparing to extend the national lockdown for another two weeks. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is expressing what she calls cautious hope that the coronavirus pandemic is slowing. She says tighter measures to contain the virus will likely not be necessary. But Chancellor Merkel added that the restrictions that are now in place must stay in effect over Easter and the days following. If not, the chancellor said, quote, we could very, very quickly destroy what we have achieved, end quote. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? 
Thank you so much, Mark. Well, as Mark just mentioned, that attempt to have another $250 billion put forward toward the small businesses has run into some hiccups up on Capitol Hill. Well, we talked with former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew yesterday. One of the things he said was, whatever assistance is given, it's going to have to last longer than we might think because the economic crisis will as well. This is part of what he said. Well, I, I have to say that the, the whole need for response here is immediate in the sense that we shut the economy down. Uh, we need to make sure that these businesses are there when we open it back up. And if we take too much time to try to get things perfect, which is always my preference, I'd love to be able to say every dot I was dotted, every T was crossed, we will look back and regret it because there will be so many business failures that the length of the recovery is extended, the depth of the recession is deepened, and the number of people unemployed lingers at a very high level. Half of American workers are working in small businesses, and we need them to be able to go back to work when the health conditions permit it. So I think time is of the essence. I thought that the funds that were put in this third bill were very helpful but I didn't think it was adequate at the time when you just look at the number of businesses that are going to need help. So I'm not surprised that they're looking at uh, providing some more assistance. What I'm trying to add into the, the thinking process and the comments I'm making is when the green light comes to open up, there has to be cash flow to reopen. So there's going to be a need to continue some of this assistance a little longer than the health crisis, just like there's going to need be a need to help people who are on unemployment with extended benefits and food stamps, SNAP, and other kinds of assistance, as long as the economy is lagging behind because of the health crisis. Uh, Jack, uh, whatever we do, whatever more uh, stimulus and spending there's done, the government's going to have to borrow an awful lot of money. We already have $2 trillion in the last spending package. That means a lot of issuance from the U.S. Treasury. Might that change the way issuance is done? For example, should we reconsider something like an ultra-long bond? Some people have even suggested maybe a war bond. As President Trump has said, we're at war with this virus. Uh, that's been used in prior wars. Should we be thinking about different sorts of issuance coming out of the U.S. Treasury? I think we need to be open to be using the whole yield curve to finance the, the, this huge increase in, in debt in the most efficient way possible. I've never been persuaded that the 50-year bond uh, is likely to have the kind of deep market that could be relied on. This feels like a dangerous time to run an experiment on a major scale uh, to, with a new concept. We have very deep, very well-developed markets. We can go long and short, and uh, I think the demand for the U.S. debt will remain strong in the global economy that we're in uh, as long as it is clear that we're responding to this crisis and that we have the resilience to bounce back. I think that the, the, the place where I'm worried about the financial shortfall being crushing and uh, without federal assistance there will be uh, terrible consequences is at the state and local level. They operate, many of them, with balanced budget requirements. If they can't fill the holes in their budget because of sales tax revenue being off, because of uh, gasoline tax revenues being off, and because of income taxes being off and delayed, they're going to start cutting back on vital services, and they're going to be canceling things like road programs, and that will have macroeconomic consequences. Overall, I've spent most of my career worrying, and I continue to worry, about the long-term sustainability of our deficit and our debt. I do not believe that in this moment, if we are penny-wise and pound-foolish, it will be a good thing. We're going to need to, to, to spend what it takes to come out of this healthy, where the economic costs in the long run will be greater and the debt and deficit will be greater. As far as financing it goes, we need, I think, to be you know, careful, as, as Treasury uh, typically is, in going into markets to make sure that we maintain the depth and liquidity uh, for what is an extraordinarily large increase in federal borrowing.
That was former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew. For more on the question of what further assistance needs to be given to the U.S. economy, we now welcome Representative Gregory Meeks. He is a congressman from New York, representing largely Queens, and he also is a prominent member of both the House Foreign Relations and Financial Services Committees. So, Congressman Meeks, thank you so much for joining us today. Give us an update on where we are in this possible uh, assistance package coming out. We just had a headline cross the Bloomberg just now that Speaker Pelosi says she wants to negotiate with the Republicans. Is there room for negotiations between the $250 billion and the $500 billion? Well, we need to negotiate. That's what we've done uh, in the past, and we've come out with a bipartisan bill. Uh, I think that uh, that's what the Speaker is looking to do now. Uh, we don't want to just have a bill uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, can't pass one of the houses or the other. So what we've been trying to do is to have those negotiations. Uh, there's a give and take. Uh, and, uh, and, and then move forward. I can tell you that Speaker Pelosi's uh, uh, initiative is, is to make sure that the families and small businesses of America uh, is appropriately uh, uh, held up and, and so that we can continue to move this economy when it's time to recover. Um, and that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at uh, some, of the, uh, some of the cracks that w might have been from stimulus three that we can fill, uh, and then uh, we can and stimulus four, and then what else in addition there too do we need to do to try to make sure that we can pick back up our economy and keep small businesses and, and keep the jobs that were there because of the tremendous amount of job loss that, they, that we've had, uh, you know, recreating and get people back to work uh, when the scientists and the, uh, and the data says it's appropriate. As I understand it, Congressman, uh, the point of uh, disagreement or difference right now between Republicans and Democrats is over the assistance to the states and to hospitals. There isn't a dispute about the need for another $250 billion for small businesses. Let's go home to your home district in Queens. Give us a sense of the need both for state assistance to try to support the New York State, but also your hospital situ situation. Look, there is no question about the need for state assistance, state sustainability that we need. Uh, to have much more money there because the states uh, will be crippled. In New York, as a result of, as a direct result of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, New York is now close to $20 billion in debt. Uh, and such, such indebtedness, uh, as indicated by uh, the former secretary, what it has caused in trying the governor and the state legislature they had to try to balance the budget. Their bu budget was, uh, had to be passed by, and it was, on April 1st. But because of that such huge deficit, there were some substantial programs uh, to, that, that, that goes to uh, hospitals and Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, the reimbursement amounts, et cetera, that still, uh, health care centers, that had to be cut in the current budget because even during the middle of this crisis, because we don't have the money to sustain ourselves as a state. Revenue is down because people are not working or paying the taxes, businesses are closed. So it's a tremendous amount of debt. Hospitals, you know, what if this uh, pandemic hasn't showed anything else is the, how <laughs> needy hospitals are, uh, and we cannot afford, afford to lose any more of them in New York. But they, I've got three hospitals in my district uh, that, that, who are now uh, well in debt, way in debt, and in focusing, don't know how they will make it afterwards if we're not able to get more money to these hospitals so they can sustain themselves and to continue. Community health care centers, uh, another vital part of local communities uh, who have been devastated by this. Uh, and, uh, and so they need to receive uh, some additional money. So we we yeah, desperately need to make sure that that money is in this fourth stimulus package that's going to go towards states to the sustainability and to help our health and hospital institutions. And, and, Congressman, let me begin a discussion that we'll have to have over years, I suspect, but it's really come to the forefront. This virus affects everybody across the country, but not equally. It affects some people more than others, and particularly your home district of Queens has gotten particularly hit hard. And let's be frank, we're seeing increasingly indications that people of color are hit particularly hard. What does that tell you as a policymaker? What should we be looking at going forward? 
Well, looking, it shows you that you need to put uh, some of the dollars into these health, and that's why I think community health care centers are tremendously important because of the underlying health issues that are li- that that are aligned in uh, these communities, as well as uh, the uh, health disparities that I know that I, as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, and uh, other members of the Congressional Black Caucus have been talking about all along, that there are health disparities in communities of color. And so in order to prevent uh, what we see taking place right now, there's got to be a focus on getting health care into these communities to the, so that we could uh, deal with some of these underlying issues uh, that, that are clearly in this community uh, where there's predominantly black and brown people and poor people. Uh, because this is not only true in urban America, it's also true in rural America. Uh, and you know, so you can go all around the country and you can see uh, why that's extremely important. Uh, you know, you, you're right about uh, my, my district uh, in, in my city, uh, but it's not just, you know, New York. You can go to New Orleans. You can go to uh, Detroit. You can go to any place where there's a major metropolitan city. But then you can also go to rural areas of Louisiana, rural areas of South Carolina, rural areas of North Carolina and Virginia. And you see some of the same uh, data that shows uh, where uh, there were people of color and poor people. Because you can go to Pennsylvania and to Appalachia and those areas. Right. They are having the same kinds right. of problems. Uh, and so we've got to be focused on that as a nation. As I say, Congressman, it's, it's a longer discussion. I want to come back and have it with you some more because we won't solve it in one discussion. But thank you so much to Representative Gregory Meeks. He's from New York, of course. And a program note now, at 7.30 tonight, we're going to have a special program. We're going to have a half hour. It's called Downturn Damage Control. It's a collection of some of the CEO interviews we've done about how their companies are trying to cope with this crisis. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio. I'm David Weston. Oil is very much on the agenda for the world today, as OPEC Plus meet leaders are meeting right now, trying to come up with an agreement to curtail production. We're joined now by Kirill Dmitriev. He is the CEO of the Russian Direct Investment Fund. So, Mr. Dmitriev, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. What do you know about what's going on in these negotiations right now, particularly between Russia and Saudi Arabia? Well, I think we are seeing a very historical uh, deal in making. Uh, you know, if there were not agreement between Russia and Saudi Arabia right now, given the decline uh, of the uh, demand for oil, I think we would uh, have seen oil prices of 10 uh, and below. And the fact that Russia and Saudi Arabia put aside some of the differences and agreed to move forward with a, a deal uh, that will involve not only OPEC Plus uh, members, uh, but also some other countries uh, who are participating in stabilization uh, of the market. I think it's very historic, um, and it's very important, particularly at this juncture uh, we are seeing right now. The reports I've seen, at least so far, is saying that the curtailing of the production will be something like 10 million barrels a day, which is well below what some people were hoping for, at least. Is that a deep enough cut? Well, first of all, I, we hear also reports that uh, the cut could be even higher because uh, non-OPEC Plus members uh, will be participating. Uh, we see interest from countries even such as Canada and Brazil uh, to participate. U.S. has been very helpful uh, in, this, um, uh, in, in those discussions. Uh, and just generally, I think uh, definitely the fact that rather than increasing output, there is a clear agreement to cut output significantly um, is important. And I think this alliance can also adjust its strategy based on the market conditions. But what we also like about this deal, it's not a deal for two months. It's not a deal for five months. What we see so far, it's a deal for two or so years. And I think this longer-term approach to the market is very important for consumers for producers, for consumers, to give stability uh, in the market that obviously saw lots of volatility uh, recently. 
Mr. Dimitrov, we spoke earlier in this program with the U.S. Secretary of Energy, he's Dan Briette, and he said the U.S. really had stepped up and done its part through natural market forces because you saw that the output from the United States has been cut rather substantially. Is that good enough for the Russians? Well, we see U.S. projections of uh, declining of oil production by 1.7 million barrels uh, this year, and we believe it can be even higher. Uh, we also have seen very positive comments from a Texas regulator uh, who basically is willing to take some steps to stabilize uh, Texas market because, you know, there are almost 10 million jobs at stake in the U.S. Uh, if oil industry and gas industry is not stable. So I think U.S. has been very positively working on this, uh, definitely very positively working uh, with Russia. And it's an example where Russia, U.S., Saudi working together can bring so much more important stability uh, in the world economy that has too much debt, that has low uh, demand, uh, and obviously a significant uh, black swan, which is coronavirus. So only by working together, including Russia, the U.S., uh, can we move forward? And I think this uh, deal and the G20 meetings that will be happening tomorrow shows that countries are stepping up and Russia and U.S. are working more and more together to stabilize uh, key economic parts uh, of the world economy. Uh, what uh, do we need to have happen with that black swan for the oil industry to get its stability back? I mean, as you say, this pandemic threw everybody for a loop. It certainly caused a lot of chaos within the oil markets. How long can the oil markets survive this in terms of really depressed demand? When do we need the demand to come back? Well, we see already in some countries the restart of the economic activity. Uh, we see examples that through more testing of the population, it's possible to restart economic activity. We've seen that Wuhan uh, in China is open now. And uh, I think the restart of economic activity will definitely start happening uh, this year. And I think more and more governments understand that, you know, you really need to ensure that there is a clear plan uh, to restart economic activity. And it can be done through extensive testing of population. But definitely there are successful countries like Korea and others who have demonstrated that it can be done. And uh, we believe that the restart of economic activity will be happening, you know, sooner rather than later. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Dmitriev. Great to have you with us today. It's Kirill Dmitriev. He is the CEO of the Russia Direct Investment Fund, talking about oil and the Russian apparent agreement with Saudi Arabia. Coming up here, we're going to be talking with Richard Trumka. As we know, all of our workers are on the front lines in one shape or another, even if they're working from home. But to particularly those who serve in hospitals, those who are our frontline workers who are really trying to take care of us. In addition to that, though, there are other people we might not think about as on the front lines. And those can be think people like the transportation workers, people who are driving the buses and running the subways, who are getting those key people, doctors and nurses and other health professionals, to their jobs. And they have become, uh, they've come under a fair amount of pressure from this coronavirus themselves. Richard Trumka is the head of the AFL-CIO. He represents over 12 million workers around the country. And we welcome him now. So, Mr. Trumka, can you hear me well? I can, David. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I was eager to talk to you about this. It was a shocking story that we saw just a couple of days ago, uh, how many New York transit workers have died already and how uh, there are thousands now that have this virus. And you mentioned this, Richard, to us a week or more ago, saying we should be looking out for our transit workers. Give us a sense from your vantage point of the situation with the transit workers. Well, David, we're being exposed. Workers are being exposed to the virus in every sector right now because we lack PPE. Uh, and that's a crisis that this administration could have avoided. Uh, what we're seeing right now uh, is that the CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, is drafting guidelines to accommodate the shortage of equipment and not the other way around. They're not drafting the guidelines to protect our workers. And here's a classic example. The new guidelines do not say that COVID can be transported by air, because if they did that, they would have to issue N95-type respirators to all of our members, to those transit workers, 
to grocery workers, to people that are on the front line helping every single day, and they won't do that. So they're accommodating the shortage rather than accommodating the health and safety of our members, and as a result, we're dying. Uh, we're dying in every sector. Nurses are dying. Uh, transit workers are dying. Home care workers are dying. Retail workers are dying. Grocery store workers are dying. All those people that must be at work right now to help the rest of us survive. Do you have hope, Richard, that in fact we are gearing up enough of production of that PPE, that personal protection equipment, such as N95 masks and other things, gloves, gowns, PAPRs, are we gearing enough enough so we will have enough so we will not be setting standards, as you say, according to what's available rather than what's needed? Well, federal purchasing contracts confirm what we already know, uh, we already knew. Uh, the Trump administration failed until mid-March to place any bulk orders for respirators, ventilators, uh, and other medical equipment. And by the time they got around to it, they were competing against the states and driving prices up, not expanding supply. And it wasn't until this very week that the Trump administration actually mandated that distributors direct PPE to the hardest-hit areas. Uh, and as a result, we're way, way, way behind the curve, uh, and people are dying, and more people have gotten uh, the COVID-19 than needed to. Uh, so now we're calling on the president to make sure that he uses the Defense Production Act uh, to federalize and centralize allocation and distribution, to expand the supply, uh, to expand the use of available respiratory protection, uh, and to provide immediate testing. Uh, to health care workers uh, and others, because if the health care workers can't go to work, the whole system will break down. And right. so it all comes back so, to so Richard, having proper PPE. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to get one more question in here, Richard, and that is this. We're starting to see some encouraging numbers, at least some plateauing, and already people are talking about a plan, just developing a plan for starting to reopen the economy. What role are you, what role is the AFL-CIO organized labor playing in trying to come up with that plan, whether at the federal level or the state? Well, we, we believe that uh, we have to be driven by the science and by the numbers, and a premature reopening of the economy will give us a tremendous setback. It's better for us to be a week late than it is a week early and re-spread that. We're talking to the congressional leaders on all four of them, the, on the Democratic side, the Republican side, in the House and in the Senate. We're also talking to the president saying what we need to do. And we have five economic essentials that we're telling them that they need to do, David. Keep frontline workers right. safe. Okay. Keep workers employed right. and protect earned pension checks. Right. Richard? I'm sorry. I want you to come back and tell me yeah. about all those five you would. That's Richard Trumpkin. He's the president of AFL-CIO. Great to have you with us always, Richard. Now, coming up, we're going to have a second hour over on Radio Balance of Power, and we'll get to talk with Ch Chef Samuelson of the Red Rooster. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. <laughs>